Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Forgiven when mercy walked in. Wow. Question for you. Good morning, everybody. Question for you. Is it okay to say it's okay when it's not, not okay? <laughs> Is it okay to say it's okay when it's not okay? Well, the answer is no. It's not okay to say it's okay when it's not okay. Real story, a pastor colleague down in the Florida conference was uh, operated. He had cancer, so um, he had surgery with real cut and stitches. And because he knew this was going to happen, he made arrangements for somebody to preach at his church the following Sabbath. He was not necessarily supposed to be there, but he decided Sabbath morning he was feeling well, so he went to church with a cut and stitches. The person that was designated preached, and at the end of the service, the pastor, this pastor of the church, was standing at the entrance, greeting people as they were leaving the sanctuary. A young lady whose wedding the pastor had officiated a few weeks before his surgery had just come back from honeymoon. She had no idea her pastor had surgery. So when she saw him, she walked straight up to him and uh, gave him a big teddy bear hug. He couldn't take it. He yelled out and said, no! Poor lady, she was scared. What's going on? What's wrong. What did I do? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, she didn't know what was going to happen. She didn't mean any harm. But that hurt. Because when somebody has a real cut and some real stitches, he or she may not be in a huggy mood. Now, this is the question again. Shouldn't he have just done something like this? It's okay. It's okay. Listen, guys. I've been taught for most of my young life that as a Christian, you have to be tough enough to take it. If they are going to give it to you, and they are going to give it to you, you have to be strong enough to take it. And when they hit you, you just say, it's okay. It's okay. Took me some time to understand from the Bible and to come to the realization, no, it's not okay to say it's okay when it's not okay. Well, why isn't it okay to say it's okay when it's not okay? This is why. In 1794, William Blake, a poet, wrote a poem called a poison tree. This is how it goes. I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath. My wrath did end. 
I was angry with my foe. I told it not. And that's where it all starts. I told it not. My wrath did grow. And I watered it in fears, night and morning with my tears. And I sunned it with my smiles and with soft, deceitful wiles. And it grew both day and night till it bore an apple bright. And my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole, when the night had veiled the pole. In the morning, glad I see, my foe outstretched beneath the tree. Question, what happened? Well, your foe ate the apple. But the apple was poison apple. Brothers and sisters, when you say it's okay, when it's not okay, in all likelihood you are growing a poison tree. You are going to bear some poison apple, and there are two poison apples, unforgiveness, produces. One is called resentment. The other is called remorse. Resentment comes from French. You know, there are tons of French words in the English language. From ressentir, which means to sense it again and again and again. The other one, remorse, comes from uh, remordere in Latin, which means to bite again and again and again. So here is the thing. When uh, you are offended, when you are the offendee, and uh, you say, it's okay. There is a good likelihood you are going to bear some uh, poison apple called resentment. You can call it honey crisp. That is still resent. It's sweet. It is sweet, but it's still poison. When you are the offender and you say it's okay. In all likelihood, you are going to be bearing a poison apple called remorse. You can call it uh, golden delicious, because it is delicious. But it's remorse. It's going to bite again and again. It's going to bite you again and again. Well. William Blake suggests that if you grow a poison tree, your foe is going to come, pick the poison apple, and uh, will die, stretched under the tree. The problem is, it's going to be you. You are going to grow the poison tree, bear the poison apple, then pick it, call it golden crisp or honey crisp or golden delicious and that's it that is the problem of forgiveness let us pray lord we are coming to you to gain wisdom from you we are realizing it's not okay to say it's okay when it's not okay and we pray that you will teach us. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, let it be so, Father. Amen. In his epistles to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul focuses as a main teaching of his theology on salvation, and for him, salvation is healing. Last time I preached from uh, the book of Ephesians, I only 
touched on uh, forgiveness in the five last minutes of my sermon, I was surprised by the overwhelming reaction because I got the feeling the whole sermon was about forgiveness. And it was just five minutes on forgiveness. And I'm realizing there is a soft and sore spot at the same time when it comes to forgiveness. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 30. And do not grieve or do not pain the Holy Spirit. And we saw last time that the Holy Spirit must be at least a person. The Holy Spirit is much more than a person, the way we can define a person, but He is at least a person. Because you can grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You can cause pain to the Holy Spirit. How? This is how. Letting not go, verse 31, the bitterness, all bitterness, wrath, anger, which is sinful anger, clamor, evil speaking, or blasphemia, slander, vilification, defamation, denigration. All those things the Apostle Paul says should be put away from you. And please notice, this is something the Holy Spirit does. It is in a passive form, not that you should not be aware of it, because unless you allow the Holy Spirit to do it, it will not be removed from you. But it is the Holy Spirit that has the ability to put those things away from you with all malice. And now it goes, verse 32, and be, more precisely, become kind to one another, kind to one another, tender-hearted, the Greek says, having good bowels, good guts, good viscera to one another. And now, that's the focus this morning. How? How does all this happen? Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you, and then it goes on, therefore be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. So that is to say, God has a specific way in Jesus Christ to forgive you. If you are supposed to be imitator of God, that means you should be forgiving and you should be forgiven as God does it in Jesus Christ. The question is, how does God forgive in Jesus Christ? The most popular answer to that is, well, God simply says, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's okay. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To confess. Yes, confession is part of of the protocol, of the healing protocol called forgiveness, according to which God forgives and based on which we are supposed to forgive one another. Let's look how that works. Matthew chapter 5, 23 and 24, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there at the altar remember that your brother has something against you. Let me ask you something. If you remember your brother has something against you, are you the offender or the offendee? 
if you remember your brother has something against you, offender or offendee? Offender. You did something to your brother, and you know because you remember. Now, uh, there is another problem here when somebody imagines stuff. Don't go out of just imagination. Go based on what you remember. If you really did something against your brother, then you may remember. So there is a point here, and there is a point here when you remember what you did in point A. So you go, Jesus says, Leave your gift there before the altar and do what? Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So that's the part that the offender has to do. And most of us know that because when we are offended, we would wait for the offender to come, don't we? But let's also look at Matthew chapter 18, that famous Matthew 18. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, who are you if your brother sinned against you? Who are you, the offender or the offendee? Now you are the offendee. And what does Jesus say? If your brother sins against you, do what? Go and tell him. This is not go public. This is not go on the news. This is go and tell him or her. His or her fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But this is a step-by-step -step process here. This is step number one. What if step number one fails? But if he will not hear, then you notch it up or hit it up a notch. And what do you do? Now you can go public, right? Uh-uh. No. Take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. That's step number two in the protocol. Not done yet. Because what if number two fails? Well, it goes on. If he refuses to hear, then, then do what? Step number three, what? Tell it to the church. That's step number three. But what if step number three fails? But if he refuses even to hear the church, then what? Then let him be to you like a hidden and a tax collector. Meaning what? Kick him out. Uh-uh. For Jesus, a hidden or a tax collector was the person in the direst need of love. And he would start with the basics of the gospel right there at the hidden and the tax collector. In other words, you cannot have expectations from there. What you can do is preach the gospel again. Very simple. Now, in your heart, please raise your hands if that's how you do it. In your heart, please raise your hand if that's how you do it. If you are not doing it like that, something must be wrong. Because it's not okay to say it's okay when it's not okay. But please notice something. 
what does Jesus tell to the offender? What does he have to do? What? What is the first word? Go. Go. So the offender has to go. What does Jesus tell the offendee? What does he have to do? What? Go. So then who goes first? Who? I don't know. Jesus didn't say, okay, look and see. If the other moves, then you move. No, Jesus said, you go. Ideally, when something happens, something goes wrong between brothers and sisters, who goes? Both go. And ideally, they will meet on middle ground. But does that happen, really? What protocol do we follow, if any? Why is it even needed to do confession? Because, okay, now these two have started going, and at one point, if they keep going, what will they do? They will end up side by side, right? And then what? You know, I have uh, three brothers. I have one older and two younger. Four of us, four boys. And the one next to me, after me, because I'm the second in line, the one following, Benjamin, that's his name. He was about four or five. And he was playing at the gate of the neighbor. This was out in the village, no danger of being uh, abducted or something. So he was playing there, right at the gate. The neighbor had uh, big metal gates. Can you imagine the metal gates with two wings? Two wings that kind of meet at one point, and there is a piece, a metal piece, where the two wings gate, uh, the, the two wings meet. That's the kisser, that's what it's called in that village, a kisser. Why is it a kisser? Because that metal piece that you put there, you stuck it in, st stick it in so it will keep the gates together, that's the kisser, that's where the gates kiss. So now my little brother is playing there, and one day as he's playing there, he picks that little piece of metal, it looks like a T, letter T, and starts playing around with it. He carries it from one place to the other. I even saw him playing with it. I didn't realize what it was. But then later that day, the neighbor lady, Auntie Anna, comes over to mom complaining that the boy took the kisser. Mom looks for the boy. Go get the boy. I'm going for the boy. The boy comes, and mom asks him, Ben, where is the kisser? A kisser, what's that? That piece of metal you played with, I don't know. Yeah, but you took it from Auntie Anna's gate. I didn't do it. So one looks at him and says, listen, you have to go find it and bring it back to Auntie Anna. He says, no, I don't want to do it. Yes, you have to go. So mumbling, he starts going. Seems that he knows where he put it. Because after a few minutes, he's coming back. I found it! I found it! I found it! Very happy. So mom tells him, okay, Ben, now you go, put it back there, and then you go to Auntie Anna and apologize. I don't want to go. No, you have to go. 
I'm not going. No, you are going. You are going. So, again, mumbling, he gets going. He gets to the gate. I'm watching him through the window. Puts that metal piece back and then looks around. And he notices Auntie Anna is at the end uh, of uh, her backyard. And he shouts, Auntie Anna, Auntie Anna. And Auntie Anna comes. And uh, when she's close, he looks at her and he says, Auntie Anna, I came to see the puppies. <laughs> and Auntie Anna took him and showed him the puppies. And the whole story with the kisser was okay. It's okay. Now, that's how we often avoid the problem. We even start walking toward one another, but then we say, ah, no, it's okay. No, 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 it's not okay to say it's okay when it's not okay. Confession is needed. James chapter 5, this is what he says. Confess, verse 16, confess your trespasses or sins or faults, offenses. I think that's the best word there. Confess your offenses to one another and pray for one another that you may be what? It is in this context that he says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not just pray and hope that now the forgiveness protocol is going to be taken out of your way. Because that's what we do quite often. We pray hoping that God will change His mind. Why is it needed to confess? This is what Ellen White says in Steps to Christ. I'm sure you know this. True confession, she says, is always of a specific character and acknowledges particular sins. They may be of such a nature as to be brought before God only. I did something wrong. God only knows I'm telling Him about what I did. They may be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals who have suffered injury through them. Or they may have, they may be of a what nature? What character? Public character and should then be as publicly confessed. Have we ever had, like in the last five, ten years here, a public confession here in the church? Or there's no public sin these days? You understand where the problem is? Why confess? Well, confess because in that process of confession, things are sorted out. In that process of confession, you may find out that some of the things you thought need forgiveness can be actually excused. The things that can be excused do not need confession do not need forgiveness. Forgiveness is for things that cannot be excused. But there are things that cannot be excused that we do for which there is only one solution, God-given solution. It's called forgiveness, and forgiveness comes with confession. And there is a precise description in the Bible as to how that works. Luke chapter 17. Take heed to yourselves, says Jesus himself. If your brother sins against you, do what? Rebuke him. 
But what does it mean to rebuke somebody? If you go to the dictionary, you may find a definition that goes in the direction of uh, tell that person off or tick that person off or bring that person down with words sharp and short or take somebody's head. That's a rebuke. What is rebuke? Well, biblically, the word epitimao, translated by rebuke, is composed of two other words, epi, which means upon or on, and timao, which means to honor or to value or to prize. And it means something like this. You have something that you put a tag on, a label, a price tag, the value of that act. And you may think, okay, so what should I write on that label? I will need somebody to help me and uh, tell me what I should write on that label. Stop. 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 How do I know that's what I have to write on it? You know Jesus rebuked the wind. From what? From? From blowing. So what did he tell the wind? Stop. Jesus also rebuked sickness. From what? From sickness destroying somebody's being. What did he say, actually? Stop. Jesus rebuked demons. What was he telling those demons? What? Stop. When you go to your brother that sinned against you, that harmed you, when you are the offendee and you go to the offender and rebuke your offender, what do you tell your offender? This what you have done to me has to what? You have to stop it. Now, if you don't do that, don't be surprised if your offender will come right back to you and do it again to you. Does it make sense? Absolutely. So, rebuke him and what? What if you rebuke him and if he what? Please notice, rebuke is not done with the intention of rejection, but with the intention of what? Repentance. When the offendee comes to the offender like this and starts doing with the offender this, Will their forgiveness happen? Rebuke is done with the intention that the offender can what? Repent. So please, offenders, please understand this. If your offendee comes to you and you don't repent, you are not forgiven. You may think you are, but you are not. Because forgiveness happens when you repent, meaning you accept forgiveness. And it goes on, verse 4. Because up to this point, it's pretty, pretty palatable. Verse 4, what does verse 4 say? And if he sins against you seven times in a day, 
and seven times in a day returns to you saying what? I repent, you shall forgive him. And this is too much. Seven times a day? You may remember in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, Peter asks, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And Jesus answers what? Seventy times seven? Well, in a lifetime you may think, well, that's okay. But seven times a day? Obviously, the point here is not maths. It is a hyperbole, meaning this. There is no limit to forgiveness. Whenever your offender says, I repent, your responsibility is to forgive. Yeah, but what if it's not honest? I don't know. Or what if your offender does not repent? Then can I just not forgive him? Well, listen, no matter what your offender does, your offer of forgiveness should always be there. Just like God always has His offer of forgiveness. No, forgiveness doesn't happen until the offender accepts it. That is, repents, changes his mind. Metanoia, metanoeo means beyond your mind. You cannot keep on with the same mindset because if you keep on with the same mindset, you will hit back again. So you have to repent. Otherwise, forgiveness doesn't happen. But that, that doesn't mean I, as an offender, uh, an offendee, can take the liberty to say, okay, you don't want it? I'm going to take it home, put it in my pocket, and uh, walk away. I don't care about you. No, no, no. Look what uh, Ellen White says. I read this last Sabbath. We should not think, that's uh, thoughts from the month of blessing. We should not think that unless those who have injured us confess the wrong, we are justified in withholding from them our forgiveness. Then she says, it is their part, indeed, yes, it is their part, no doubt, to humble their hearts by repentance and confession, but we are to have a spirit of what? Compassion toward those who have trespassed against us, whether or not they confess their fault. And in Christ's ob object lesson, this is what she says, Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful toward others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. In God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great heart of infinite love. How? How? The tide of divine compassion flows into the sinner's soul and from him to the souls of others. In other words, this is how forgiveness works. It comes as a flow from Jesus Christ and then from me, from the offendee, it goes to the offender and the offender is brought into Christ's love. Does this work? Hmm. I was in fifth grade, so that's around 10 years old. And one day, the main teacher or classmaster, that's what we call it in uh, Romania classmaster, the main teacher came to our classroom and uh, she told us, Miss Simon, that's her name, she told us, kids, we are going to the church. We are going to church today. 
Now, this was not a Seventh-day Adventist school. This was public school in an Orthodox majority country. And this was on the Hero's Day, which is a correspondent of Memorial Day. In Eastern Orthodoxy, on uh, Hero's Day, you go to church and pray to the hero saints. So the Orthodox Church being right next to the school, my main teacher wanted to take us to the Orthodox Church to pray to the saints. What should I do? Should I go or not? Well, I told her, Miss Simon, I cannot go. Why not? You know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and we don't pray to the saints. And she said, that's not a problem. You don't have to pray. You just can come with us and, and you don't have to pray. But we can't leave you here. So I said, okay, I'm going to come. So we went. We entered the premises of the church, large yard. And I started feeling odd, kind of strange, you know, for me to be there. Then we entered the cathedral, nice place. In a second, all my colleagues found a corner in front of a saint, of an icon, and they started mumbling their prayer. And I was left in the middle of that huge room looking around. And they were looking too with the corner of their eyes saying something like that, you know, really, Joe? Come on. You can't just do what everybody does. And I was standing there as a bunch of nothing in the middle of uh, nowhere. I felt miserable, and I told myself, you know, you will not go through this again. Never. Never, ever. Four years went by, uh, three and some, and uh, this is now eighth grade. I had forgotten about that incident. And one day, same hero's day, the main teacher, same main teacher comes to the classroom. And what does she say? Kids, let's pack up. We are going to church. But by this time, I have enough guts to walk straight up to her and tell her, Miss Simon, I'm sorry, I'm not going. And she looked at me and said, no, you are going. No, Miss Simon, I'm not. She looked at me and said, yes, you are. No, I'm, I'm gonna show you, I'm, no, I'm gonna show you. And this went on and on and uh, she flipped her lid, banged the door, and off she went to the principal. We were frozen in the audience, I mean, in the classroom, everybody was frozen. But then again, I got keyed up. I threw everything in my bag, and off I went. When I was heading out, my teacher was coming from the principal's office, and she spotted me, and she said, Joe! I was gone. Who cared? Next day, the circus continued. Principal was involved. Parents was, were, were called to uh, the school. The main principal, the main teacher re had received a gift, a Mother's Day gift, just a few weeks back. And because I was the valedictorian, and I got the chance to pick the gift for her. She threw the gift back. It was a mess. In response, I refused to stand by her on the picture at the end of year, eighth grade graduation picture. So I'm not on my graduation picture. But I felt good about it for a while. But then it started bothering me. And you know what? As life brings it, you go off to high school and then 
college and then you start working somewhere else, but you visit sometimes and as if somebody was orchestrating it, I would bump into her on the street, greet her respectfully, she would greet me, she would not recognize me because I changed my face, put on some beard, but years were going by, I could never get it out of my mind. Twenty years went by. Until five years ago, we were visiting the family uh, in my hometown, and I was going to preach that following Sabbath in the church, the new church, new Seventh-day Adventist church. I had never preached in it. It was newly built. And that church was two houses away from the house of my main teacher. And that week, it hit me. I thought, what if I remember the incident right when I have to preach? I will have to drop my sermon and tell them, guys, I'm going to come back in like 10, 15 minutes. Go ahead with the service. So it, it bothered me. It had bothered me many times before, and I prayed about it, you know. With prayer, you just quench it. Uh -uh. Prayer is not for that. Prayer is for you to stand up and do what? Go. So one day I'm taking my keys in a certain way. My wife spotted me. She said, uh, where are you going? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back quickly. I couldn't give her the explanations right then. So I'm going to a flower shop. I'm buying a beautiful bouquet of beautiful flowers. And I'm showing up at the house of my main teacher. I can see her working at the backyard far away. And I'm in the situation where I have to shout. Miss Simon, and she hears me, and she comes, and she looks at me, she couldn't recognize me, and uh, I'm there standing in front of her with a bouquet of flowers, and I start confessing, and as I'm confessing, she starts swallowing her tears, and then she starts confessing. Yes, I was abused. She abused me. But I didn't tell you too much about what I told her and how abrasive I was to her. But she said, you know, I could never forget that incident. And I knew I overreacted, but I was hurt. And, you know, sometimes I would ask myself, will I ever have a chance to meet that kid again. I can't believe you're here. And I'm telling you, that same day, in that front yard, two huge poison trees, uh, trees came tumbling down. I can still hear the rumbling. Because, yes, Jesus is ready to cut the poison tree down. It's not okay to say it's okay when it's not okay. I don't know how many Miss, Mrs. or Mr. Simons you have. I don't know if, if my eyes were open, like miraculously, and I, I could see everybody's poison tree. I wonder, I, what would I see at one of the churches where I use this illustration? Somebody told me, Pastor, you, you would have seen a poison forest. And I said, yeah, and we need some poison forest deforestation. And I know somebody that can do that. Please follow the protocol. 
Will it be easy? No. You will be a weird person. But that's the only way that biblically, by God's word, is ratified as a healing, effective and efficient healing protocol. Paul says, just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Amen.